at that time, Alan Gardner and his wife, Trixie, back in the 1970s, were kind of a big deal. They had been the group that first taught a chimpanzee named Washoe American Sign Language. It had been in 60 Minutes, and there was all these stories about how we're going to talk to the animals and all this kind of stuff. And in fact, they were sort of in a war with Noam Chomsky over whether or not non-human primates could actually use language. So he was a world-famous uh, scientist, and it struck me as odd he'd be calling me. A couple of months later, actually the day after we were married, my the wife and I packed up everything we owned in a Dodge Colt and drove out to Reno. And I started working with Moja. Uh, Moja was the second generation of signing chimps. Washoe had kind of graduated, if you will, and they wanted to raise uh, uh, chimps from birth to see uh, not only if they could acquire language from human beings, but would they use language from chimpanzee to chimpanzee. And if you've never worked with a chimp, it's kind of intimidating. Uh, it was in some ways almost funny because uh, the goal of the project was to raise chimpanzees in the kind of environment that would foster language development. And so they really kind of raised them as if they were children in a middle class family. The chimps had little down jackets to go out when it was cold. They had you know, bathrobes and after they were done taking a bath and we would cook and prepare food for them and everything because the mission of the project was to see how much language we could promote and in particular could we promote non-concrete, more elaborate, more arbitrary uses of language. Not just naming things and saying, I need to go to the bathroom or eat or, you know, whatever, but could we prompt more reflective and abstract language performance? So where all this comes in terms of the humanities is that essentially the core of that research project was to explore the fundamental question of what the humanities is about, which is what is the human experience? And the question was, could language be uniquely human or in fact is it something that's shared with other species? Descartes and the rationalists argued of course that language and thought were synonymous and it was the thing that separates us from other animals. Uh, it's so infused in Western law, philosophy, religion, uh, and, and culture that until this chimpanzee in Reno started to sign with people, I think it was assumed that humans, that, the, that humans were unique because they had language, they had rationality. And the purpose of this study was to find out if that was true. I ended up learning uh, a few, really two things from that research project that changed my world. The first was that there is no bright, clear line between humans and non-humans. I have worked with children who have less language than Moja, the chimpanzee. Now, granted, those children, and in some cases adults, have disabilities. But I don't think anyone would argue that they are less human than a chimpanzee, even though they had less language than the chimpanzee. I learned that it's not in the world of species, it's not us and them. It's we're all a family and they're, we're all part of the same fabric. The second thing I learned was really about myself, and that is that, you know what, I could do this science stuff. Um, I was pretty good at it. I picked it up pretty quickly, had the dispositions, and I kind of gave up on the goal of becoming an elementary school teacher. I only stayed one year at the University of Nevada, Reno, but eventually, because of the confidence that I acquired there, I ended up getting my PhD at 
University of California, Berkeley, and went on to, um, to a career as a professor and now a dean of humanities and social sciences, which has been incredibly rewarding and fulfilling.